Hello. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our first panel for the NIC Public Forum or Popcorn Forum. Okay. Um, my name is Fran Barr. I'm the moderator for this panel. And we have a wonderful lineup here for you today. Um, and so what I'd like to do is introduce our three uh, personages. Um, but first, just as a reminder, if you haven't done so already, would you please turn off your cell phones? <laughs> I had to turn mine off too, I almost forgot. Um, First, we are going to have Angie Debo, who is portrayed by Marion Ackerman, uh, um, anthropology instructor here at the college. Angie Debo's meticulous research of Oklahoma history brought her to a disturbing discovery that five civilized Indian tribes of Oklahoma were the victims of a complex swindle. What Ms. Debo did was to expose this swindle, and she was shunned as a troublemaker until Princeton University published her books. She has since become um, sort of the evidence or the primary case for federal court cases today involve, involving tribal rights. And I'm sorry to say that she's running just a little bit late. She is the Grand Marshal for a parade. She is hurrying here, and I'm sure she'll be here any moment. Um, our second speaker will be Amelia Earhart, portrayed by Amy Wilkerson. Uh, Amelia Earhart, as you all know, endures in the American consciousness as one of the world's most celebrated aviators. And she has quite um, a presentation for you today. Third, we have Jonathan Kozal, portrayed by Ken Pello. And um, Jonathan is um, an educator and, um, and a very outspoken author. His latest book is called The Shame of the Nation, The Restoration of Apartheid in American Schooling which argues that racial segregation in public schools is beyond critical, perhaps as, it was, as bad as it was three decades ago. So we have a wonderful lineup here today. And um, what we will do is each of the speakers uh, will have um, a presentation, a monologue of sorts. And then after we are finished with the three speakers, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. So be thinking of them as, as they go through their presentation. Uh, and with that, I think I will begin with Amelia Earhart. Amelia? Well, ahead of me lies my next record flight. It may be my last. I have realized that it is almost time to let the younger generation of flyers come along. And this flight ahead of me is the longest that I have ever made. I am going to attempt to fly r around the world at the equator longer than anyone else has ever attempted to do. It has been said to me that I only have a 50-50% chance of completing this flight successfully. Those are pretty good odds. I will take them. I believe that a woman has to do an attempt to do the difficult, the difficult things in life just as men do. And if she fails, then it is only going to give more incentive to other females, other women to try. I'm feeling just a little nostalgic as I look at this last flight, I'm beginning just a tiny bit to feel my age as I see all the younger female flyers come along. And I'd like to go back just a little to my childhood and remember some of the things that I did as a girl, which were perhaps a little unusual for this 
year or this time. As a girl, I did not play the games the boys played. I played as though I were a boy. I even dressed in bloomers, much as I prefer to dress in trousers today. I, my friends and I, my, my girlfriends and I, played in the Orient or in Africa. I loved to shoot rats in the barn with a 22 rifle. I would ride a sled, face down, belly slamming, we called it. And I loved to climb trees and all of those things that boys enjoyed. I remember very much when I was seven years of age that my father took me to the St. Louis World's Fair and there, for the first time, I rode a Ferris wheel. I adored the height and the speed of that wonderful ride. And perhaps that pointed me on the road of my destiny. From there, I really, at that fair, wanted to ride so much the roller coaster. And my mother, bless her heart, put down her foot strongly and said no. My answer was simply to go home and build my own ride. And I did that. After that, at high school, and while I was at finishing school at Ogons, I assiduously clipped out every article I could find on women with careers, women who achieved in life. I feel that it is very important for women to have the choice of having a career, not simply to be a housewife. Recently, in a census, women who were housewives were listed as having no occupation. For me, having a career is as important as the water I drink, the air I breathe. I am passionate about my career. I have done many things, and I'll tell you just a little of the early things I was interested in, but now I concentrate very much on flying and on speaking engagements. It's nice to be able to talk to this audience because I have to go in in a few minutes to some journalists and to do a very formal presentation. So it, for me, this is a delightful change just to be a little informal. But I've also done many things with airlines. Uh, at the moment, I work with the transcontinental air transport and I, one of my main aims is to encourage women to fly. One day, I believe, we will be flying from coast to coast, transcontinental, and also around the world. And it will be quite an ordinary thing to do. But back in the early days, I feel the early days are a long time ago in the 20s. But the 20s, it was rather a difficult time for women to have any career. I did quite a few things. I was, very, I was very fond of nursing. I did that for quite a while. That was inspired by me seeing the young men who returned from the Great War, missing a limb with no eyesight, having been blinded and shell-shocked. And then for me, it became clear that I needed to be a nurse. And I started that career in Canada. And there, I was around airplanes for the first time in my life. At the military hospital where I worked, I watched those great birds slide across the hard-packed snow and then roar into the air, echoing from the evergreens round the field. And it was then I first experienced my urge to fly. Not long after that, at Toronto, at an air show, air show is, of course, as you know, very, very popular. I went to an air show at Toronto, and this small red plane, I think he was a little bored. He had done all of the tail spins and the barrel rolls, everything he had in his vocabulary of flying, and that small red plane started to fly very low over the heads of the spectators. And then it seemed to come lower and lower straight towards me. And I refused to move. I felt as though that small red plane, plane was speaking to me. Not long after that, I, for the first time, went up in a plane. 
I was out with a wonderful uh, pilot called Frank Hawks. And then I found my first instructor, Netta Snook. And Netta took me up in a Canuck. A Canuck was rather like a turkey in terms of planes. And that Canuck was slow to climb. It was hard to turn. It had a very narrow range. And I must admit, I soon became tired of it. But I fell in love with the first airplane that I was going to buy. And that was Burt Kenner's little Airster. An Airster, a wonderful little plane, a sport plane that could climb fast. It, could, it had a range much further than the Canuck. And it was delightful. I would call that a canary in comparing that to the Canuck. And that was the first plane I bought. From then on, I have owned several planes. I've owned uh, an Airster, I've, the Airster. I've also owned several Vegas. And they're all wonderful planes in their own way. But I did need a career. Women in our days need a career if they hope to do anything in their own right, something that they feel passionate about. And the career that drew me was social work. I, in time, became a part-time social worker at Denison House, which is a very well-known settlement house on Tyler Street in Boston. You may have heard of it. And there I realized the wonderful pleasures that you get with working with children. I taught English. I taught um, many people in citizenship classes. And I got a great amount of pleasure from that. It has been said that perhaps I've always been a social worker at heart. And I loved their motto. Their motto was philanthropy, not, excuse me, not philanthropy, but democracy. And that is a motto which I thoroughly endorse to this day. Well, things went on. I was flying in the evenings and at weekends and as much as I could, but I was finally given an invitation the chance of a lifetime. And that was to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. What a shining adventure. Who could say no to that? I was given the opportunity to be on the flight, the friendship flight. Now that was in a plane, it was called a Fokker, and that was owned by Amy Guest, who at one time wanted to fly herself. But I believe her husband put his foot down and said no. So I was given the opportunity to go. There was a wonderful pilot, Bill Stoltz. He was the pilot and also the navigator. And there was uh, Slim, Lou, Lou Slim Gordon, the co-pilot, and I was named pilot. Well, it took, as it always does in these flights, months to get ready. But finally, we were up at, at Newfoundland, ready to leave. Now, this was a modified plane. It had been fitted out with pontoons. In those days, we were very afraid of taking off and landing near water. So the idea was that this plane would be much safer if it was fitted out with pontoons. It was also capable of carrying many gallons of gasoline, enough to carry us over the Atlantic. Now you have to remember that crossing the Atlantic was the feat that every pilot in the 1920s after Charles Lindbergh wanted to achieve. He had done that so magnificently in 1927. So here we were in 1928. We're up, we went to Newfoundland. We were there for days getting ready. And the weather was very bad indeed. It was foggy. We finally managed to take off, taxiing across the bay for over three minutes until that old plane, that Fokker, could rise. And then we were over the Atlantic for many hours. It took 20 hours and 40 minutes, which has been, that record has been broken many times since then. But 20 hours and 40 minutes. It was so bad that we passed right over Ireland. We did not see Ireland. And we're looking, we are looking for Southampton, where thousands of people were waiting. We were later to find out. We flew, we finally saw land, we came into land, 
And I'll never forget this. We came down into a bay, and we, weren't, we really did not know where we were. And we landed there, and we sat in the water. You have to remember, we had no way of getting to shore. And finally, a little man rode up beside us and said to myself in the open hatch of the plane, do you want something? And I said to him, where are we? And he said where we were. Well, where we were was Bury Port in Wales. And Bill was so restless, he needed to get off of that plane. And he finally did that. Okay. Um, so that was the very beginning. Since then, I have done many things. I have broken records. I have been the first woman to fly across the Atlantic alone, solo. I have broken transcontinental speed records. I have done many things. I feel it is so important for women to have this passion in life, to do something that they want to do because they need to do it. I believe that women can do anything that a man sets out to do. But I will tell you, the young women that are sitting here today, you will have to work twice as hard to get the same amount of credit as a man. In closing, I found something just the other day. I wrote this poem quite a long time ago when I was at Denison House. But I found it the other day, and I'd like to just read it, if I may, in my nostalgic moment, because I believe that it says something, too, that we all have to meet our heart's desire in life. We all need to strive for what is important to us. And it goes like this. Courage is the price that life exacts for granting peace. The soul that knows it not knows no release from little things, knows not the livid loneliness of fear, nor mountain, nor mountain heights where bitter joy can hear the sound of wings. How can life grant us boon of living, compensate for dull, gray ugliness and pregnant hate unless we dare the soul's dominion? Each time we make a choice, we pay with courage to behold resistless day and count it fair. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. And next, I would like to invent, uh, invite Jonathan Kozal to speak with you. He's looking serious. I am Jonathan Kozal from Boston, from Privilege, uh, with a Harvard University education and I had no intention of being a teacher. Then in 1964, at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, and when three young activists were murdered in Mississippi for registering uh, black people to vote, I had to get involved. And so I went into the black community of Boston and volunteered to teach in a reading program for black children. That made me want to be a teacher, that experience. I had no credentials. Uh, but if I was willing to teach in the black community in a segregated school at a reduced salary, I was hired. In all, I spent about 10 years teaching in the Boston public schools. Uh, and uh, in grassroots storefront programs and church programs, always with black children. And it was during this period of time that I wrote my first book on education, Death at an Early Age, which indicted the public schools of Boston for the destruction of the hearts and minds of Negro children. Uh, my attentions then changed and I started to work in social problems uh, throughout the nation with 
uh, poor farmers in New Mexico and Arizona in education and in health care. Uh, in many states with uh, the problems of illiterate adults and in New York with the problems of homeless people. After some time in New York City, I realized I wanted to get back to uh, working in the public schools and working with the uh, school children again. And so in the fall of 1988, uh, I started off on another journey. I visited uh, many cities, many schools, and I was writing books at this period of time, and principals and teachers uh, acquainted with my books uh, would invite me to their schools and uh, to teach uh, a, a lesson or two and to be involved in discussions. Wherever I went throughout the nation, I discovered that the suburban schools that were integrated either voluntarily or uh, from the courage of civic leaders or by force of law, the teachers and the children in those schools were very happy, uh, very positive, high-spirited. That was not the case I found in the inner city schools that remained more segregated than they have been in the 1960s. There I found the schools still in a terrible state of disrepair, overcrowded, unsanitary, and the Hispanic and black children that I visited with came from the poorest uh, neighborhoods, the poorest environments, and the federal government at that time under President Ronald Reagan had reduced the funding to social programs and to low-cost housing, making the situations so much worse. For example, in the South Bronx, the poorest congressional district in the United States of America, in public school 65 that I spend a great deal of time working in, and I have established friendship with parents, with children, with teachers, with doctors, with ministers, with priests, because AIDS, HIV, was ripping through the South Bronx, and maternal and pediatric AIDS were causing unbelievable sorrows for the children. Throughout the United States of America and all of the urban inner cities that I visited, the Hispanic and black population of the students ran at over 95% in those schools. The Civil Rights Project of Harvard University points out that three-fourths of our black Hispanic students attend minority schools and two million of the black students in this nation attend what we call apartheid schools where 99 to 100 percent of the students are non-white. Even that doesn't begin to explain or describe the resegregation in our nation. In the large cities of uh, Washington, D.C., and Chicago, and Detroit, uh, in the public schools, the inner city public schools, the population of black Hispanic students exceeds 95%. In the colossal high schools of inner city New York, uh, John F. Kennedy High School with 4,000 students, uh, Harry S. Truman High School, and Adley Stevenson High School with 2,500 students apiece. 95% of the students are black and Hispanic. As the isolation of these schools and the, f the, the financing of schools decreases. 
principals in those inner city segregated schools are forced to consider mandated programs and standardized programs that principals in the suburban schools never have to consider. For example, again, in public school 65, in uh, the district of Mott Haven, in the South Bronx, where I spend uh, uh, a lot of time, there the students are subjected to the most rigid and standardized instruction imaginable. Every facet of learning is subjected to some name and numbered competency. Even, even the sorrowful pronouncements of Eeyore and the soft perplexities of Pooh are held up to some name and numbered competency to explain what Pooh is saying by using third, Rule 37A. Why can't the students be asked or let to write a short story about how they spent the afternoon with Pooh and friends in the Hundred Acre Wood. I visited other schools and uh, in other cities too. Uh, using the same rigid standardized curriculum titled SFA, Success for All, with the same name and numbered competencies, always students being labeled. Uh, if you were the top group, if you were uh, group four or label four, that meant you, the conclusions uh, that you drew uh, from your required uh, lesson were very sound. Group three and label three, just a little bit less sound. And uh, group two was very unsound. We don't know what happened to group one. They were never mentioned. Perhaps they were invisible. Many of these schools, too, emphasized business and marketing. And uh, there were signs, poster boards, all over in the various classrooms and schools that said, managers wanted, uh, sign up to be a manager today. There were managers for every activity in the classroom. There were managers for... Uh, the bookshelves and managers for the art supplies and managers for the supply of paper. There was a manager to hand out the paper to his classmates and a manager to collect the paper from her classmates and another manager to redistribute the paper from the children or from the teacher back to the children. The principal explained to me, she said, uh, we want these children to know that here in the United States of America, if you work hard and prove yourself, you can be a success no matter what you have done. That last statement kind of bothered me. And I asked her what she meant by that, no matter what you have done. She said, even if you have committed and been arrested for a felony, you can be a manager. In the Roosevelt District of Long Island, very heavily segregated district, an educator, a New York educator, told me, this is New York's Soweto. There were 3,000 Hispanic and black students living in an area one and a half square miles. The senior students and the middle school students shared the same building and so I uh, visited the school and uh, a teacher escorted me to various classrooms all empty and I said well I, I'd like to see a classroom with students at work and she guided me to this large classroom and there were all the students in there sewing 
some sewing by hand, some at machines, and uh, they were all sewing pillows. I suppose that was the lesson for the day or the week or the month. Uh, and the teacher told me that uh, in the, there was a state mandated curriculum that uh, all the students had to have three quarters of a year of a course called Home and Careers. But she said these students, these students have to have two years of sewing by hand and two years of sewing by machine. Okay. I, uh, I was a little bit concerned by that. Ten students out of, ten eighth grade students out of 220 um, past the eighth grade required examination the previous June. No, no senior boy graduated from high school, and uh, uh, of 178 students entering in the ninth grade, um, only 80 remained three years later when they were seniors. Why all the emphasis on sewing? Why not on language arts, on reading and writing, and spelling and computer literacy. You go into these segregated schools wanting to enjoy the children. I walk into a classroom of 25 or 30 students. I look in some of the students I've known since they were born and I look into their eyes and they search mine. I cannot see any hint of the moral mandate that a generation of activists and idealists lived for, worked for, and sometimes died for that has survived in these communities with these children. What is most sad for me is that these children know nothing about the world and the life that I have lived most of my life in. And the children from that world know nothing about the children in this segregated community. And never will unless some of these children make it to college and even then it will be different. Because the sweetness of those inner city children will have been corroded and will have been replaced by a hardness caused by a calculated caution of fear. I have believed for 40 years, and I still believe today that we would be an infinitely better nation if we knew each other now. Thank you. Well, uh, we're waiting for Amelia Earhart. I mean, I'm sorry, Angie Debo. Sorry, Amelia, <laughs> did I surprise you? Oh, here she is. Here comes Angie. Thank you. The Grand Marshal. I've said the most terrible things about Oklahoma, and nobody seems to hold it against me. Why, they made me Grand Marshal of the parade at, at Prairie City Celebration Days. So that's why I'm running a little bit late. Oh, I need my, my book. I brought my journal. It's a little hard to remember everything today, so I brought a few notes with me. Um, I, I need to sit down right now. Young man, would you bring me out a chair, please? Thank you. 
Very good. Thank you, young man. Well, your, your pamphlet there has me wrong. I am, I am not an anthropologist. I'm a historian, though I must admit I have borrowed very unabashedly from anthropologists in the way that I did use methods of research. I, I am claimed to be the first to use ethnographic research methods in my historical accounts. I was born January 30th, 1890. It was just one year after Indian Territory was opened up to settlement. In fact, the very date of my birth is the date of the closing of the frontier. Indians had owned all the land of Oklahoma. When the tribes were removed from the southeast, they were promised that that land would remain theirs under their governorship for as long as the waters run. But Indian Territory was opened up for settlement on April 22nd, 1889. At noon the signal came, a, a shot was fired, and the famous land rush began. The whole area just swarmed with homesteaders and railroad builders and founders of new towns. There just wasn't any limit to their expectations. And that was just 10 years before my family moved to Oklahoma. I was nine years old when my family came here. I rode in a covered wagon with my mother and my brother while my father went ahead with all the farm equipment. I hoped I'd see an Indian, and I was very disappointed because I didn't. All I knew about Indians was what I'd read in school. When I was ready to enter high school, they didn't have one, and so I had to just mark time on the farm. That was one of the most miserable times of my life. When I was 16, however, I began to teach in the rural schools, and that made life more bearable for me. And eventually, they did build a high school. I was 23 when I graduated. But I went on to college. I went to the University of Chicago, and I got my degree in history, and later my master's degree. But the history field was closed and barred to women. Even a degree, with a degree, there wasn't a thing a woman could do to get a job teaching in the universities. But I could write, and all I asked for was a fair field. And so I began to investigate the termination of the five civilized tribe of Oklahoma. As I got deeper into my research, I began to learn some very disturbing things. I didn't know that all of eastern Oklahoma was dominated by a criminal conspiracy to cheat the Indians out of their property, and that this conspiracy went all the way to the legislature. Even the governor was involved. Judges and lawyers were involved. I didn't know these things were so. Nobody had ever written about that history of Oklahoma. And when I got into it, I couldn't honestly back out. I wasn't going to cover it up again. And so I told it. And I name names. Now I think that's what a historian should do. There were times in those dark halls and basements 
where I did my research in those government buildings when I felt a fear because those people I was naming were still alive. I began to find out some terrible information about that termination policy, and those allotments, government putting in the record that these are the things the Indian peoples wanted. Why, nothing could be further from the truth. So I kept on with it. Indian people were cheated out of their lands. They were cheated out of money from oil found on their lands. And the orphans, oh, the orphans, it was terrible. Indians had always taken care of their orphans, either family members or they had their own orphanages. But now, courts appointed lawyers to be their conservators, and they took their money. These politicians, these lawyers, these businessmen, they would buy lists of orphans. Why, some of them had 15 orphans that they would have the court appoint to them, and they would take all of their money. I used primary sources and documented my account thoroughly. Those scholars who previewed my work gave the best reviews but because of the potentially explosive nature of my findings, many of the people I named, remember, were still alive. The University of Oklahoma Press, excuse me, who had promised to publish my book, changed their mind. And I had to go out and find me another publisher. It took me about five years to do that, but I kept at it. And I finally did find a publisher, Princeton University. They called my book, and still the waters run. Since then, I have written, edited, or co-authored 13 books. Not all of them are about Indian American history, but those that are have received many honors. More importantly, the Indian people have been able to use this documentation in courts of law. I, too, have been called upon as expert witness in many courts of law. Because of these writings, I was able to contribute to changes in the field of American Indian history. I have been called a revisionist historian because I told the history of American Indians from a native point of view. That is, American history is a history of conquest and exploitation, not a history of settlement. I've advocated for Indian rights. I set up a huge network of friends, of acquaintances, and anyone I could get interested to write letters to congressmen, to senators. When the Alaskan Indians were in danger of termination, my network went to work, and all my friends wrote many letters and helped those people in Alaska retain their precious land base. I am getting old now, and I began to think back on my life, as you do when you get old. And I think I was about 11 years old when I made a decision that service and integrity were the creative force that would drive my life. And it's dominated my life ever since. 
Throughout my life, I have sought the truth, and I've written it. That's what a historian should do. And I thank you all for coming today and for listening to our presentations. Angie, and thank you, um, Marion. Um, I wonder, since each of our characters did not have an opportunity to go out of character and explain why they chose who they did, um, maybe they could take a minute to do that, starting with you, Marion. You're out of character. No mic. Oh, here we go. It was an easy choice. Um, I teach Native American uh, classes here at NIC, and um, only recently myself came upon the, the writings of Angie DeBeau and immediately had a passion for her, her integrity, for her writings, for her hard work, for her sincerity. And uh, I had thought that if Tony had decided to do another Chautauqua, Angie DeBeau would be top on my list. Thank you. Um, Ken, Ken Pello, uh, portrayed Jonathan, because now I'm not sure how to say that correctly. Is it Kozol? Kozol. Okay. Here you go. Uh, I, I'm Ken Pello. I'm a retired teacher from uh, the Spokane uh, Public School District. Um, yeah, this has been my this is my fifth uh, Chautauqua here at the Popcorn Forum, and I enjoy him very much. I have uh, been acquainted with uh, Jonathan Kozol's works and all of the books that he's written. He's written many many books to, uh, about the uh, segregated schools in, uh, in in America and uh, the uh, problems uh, of the segregated communities in America. And uh, his last two books, The Ordinary Resurrections, uh, that talk about, describes the suffering of the children in, uh, in the South Bronx of New York, which is the, probably the poorest section in the United States of America. And uh, uh, then his latest book, uh, just published this year on the shame of the nation, uh, again, indicts our country for uh, its complete uh, abandonment uh, and the resegregation of uh, our inner city schools. Great. Could you pass that to Amy, please? <laughs> I have a little left. Oh, okay. Uh, I wanted to move. <laughs> um, I chose Amelia Earhart. I'm interested in her for very personal reasons. I was named Amy after both Amelia and Amy Johnson, who was a famous English flyer, later known in this country as Amy Mollison. And both of these women were held up to me in my childhood as being women to emulate, women of courage who were independent and who chose to be different in their lifetime. And in a small part, I think they did influence me knowing that. So, very personal reason. Fran, they need to go back in character to the question. Okay, they will go back in character because I know you have questions for them. So, uh, I will take questions now and I'll hand you the mic. Amelia Earhart, because I saw you about 1935. I was a high school girl in a little town in New York State, and you were walking across the street from me, and I recognized you from your pictures. And me and all my, I and all my girlfriends wondered what your romantic situation might be. You look much, much too attractive not to have been uh, in romantic situations, and then we heard you were going to have a male co-pilot all the way around the world. Would you? Well, that is still my plan at this point, to have uh, a co-pilot. 
uh, Frank Noonan is the person who will accompany me. As far as my, um, I like men very much. Um, I have reservations about them at times, but you should know that I am married. I choose to be uh, known as Amelia Earhart. Sometimes I'm known as Amelia Earhart Putnam because my husband is George Putnam. I married him in 1931. We have our own arrangement in marriage. Um, the only reservations I've ever had about men, if I may add, is more their um, attitude towards women, especially when they get married. It seems as though they want to confine women and rather put them in an iron cage, I've sometimes thought. I have been lucky enough to escape that in my lifetime, but I do like men very much. I have very many wonderful friends who are pilots. I prefer to be known as a pilot and they are wonderful friends to me. And you look vaguely familiar. <laughs> Did we speak? It's delightful to see you again. Ms. Uh, Earhart uh, Putnam, uh, it's been reported that your husband is rather ambitious and he was instrumental in encouraging or, or demanding that you take this flight um, perhaps before you were prepared for it. Well, I feel I am prepared for this flight. I must admit there have been difficult times preparing for it. But George and I have a very we have a relationship which works for both of us. George, as you know, is a very busy person. He is a promoter. He is now involved in a film studio in, in, in California, but he is really my right-hand man. And as I've said, this is probably the last flight that I will make of this type because I do want to give way to younger flyers. But I want to do this because I want to do it, not because George is pushing me into it. Hello, Amelia. <laughs> I don't want to put a damper on your positive attitude, but hypothetically, if you weren't to make it around the world, how do you think people would remember you? I hope to rem be remembered the way I've lived, a woman who has dared to risk the same things that a man would risk. And as I've said, I am prepared to go into this. I've been told I only have a 50-50 chance, and I take that chance. That is the way I try to live my life, and that is the way I enter into this flight. On a scale of 1 to 10, how nervous would you say you are? I don't get nervous before I do something like this. Uh, could we have questions for the other two? <laughs> um, I will go to the back and then I'll come back. My question is for Mr. Kozal. You talk quite a bit about the resegregation of our nation through um, the public school system. And I think that's a very real concern. So considering that, how would you think that the uh, federal mandates that are bringing on the high stakes testing put forth by the No Child Left Behind, how do you think that is going to, or if it is going to contribute to this resegregation, either intentionally or non-intentionally? That's a very good question. and. Uh, there have been a lot of people addressing that concern that the standardized examinations today that we're submitting uh, so many of our students to in the public school system uh, are geared only to uh, the students that come from more affluent socioeconomic levels and not 
and, and, and they're not geared to helping the poor students, uh, the students from the poor socioeconomic levels, that it's going to create even a wider gap. Uh, as I mentioned before, that's what's happening in the segregated schools today. Uh, there's an entirely different curriculum it isn't the same curriculum that's being uh, used in the suburban white schools at all. Uh, there's an indication maybe that uh, we don't think that the uh, students in the inner city segregated schools that they're, they're able to do the work. And we're creating a wider gap in our society today. This is a question for you as well. Um, what, this is very evident that this is an issue, that this resegregation is an issue. What can we do to combat this and, and to combat this and, and to uh, ensure that this is no longer an issue in the future? I mean, it, it, it's quite obviously a significant issue even at the college level. Well, I think we have to uh, try to work together. Uh, at the college level, we're not going to see the great numbers if you look around today at this group of people. And how many black and Hispanic students do we see in our community throughout the Pacific Northwest even? If you look at our, the entire community and the school systems, uh, and that'll continue, and that continues throughout our nation, no matter whether you're in California and Los Angeles or San Francisco or Kansas City or Detroit or Chicago. Uh, unless the people can come together and uh, in your neighborhood, uh, PTAs, the teachers and the parents and everybody working together to develop programs and raise funds, not just for the children in your own community, not just for your own interests, but for the welfare of the whole. And that's what we have to, that's what has to be done. And if it isn't, uh, we're gonna look at uh, the problem continuing and the gap between our people widening. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, this is for Ms. DeBow. Um, you did bring to the consciousness through your books that the Indian tribe's property was taken away from them. Uh, did anything result from this? Was anything restored to them? Well, unfortunately, in Oklahoma, um, monies were not restored, but recognition was given eventually that these things had happened. And certainly the lessons that were learned there um, were taken up by Indian peoples everywhere in the New World. and, and and so they knew that the research was there and that they could use that research in their own legal battles to prevent happening, those kinds of things happening to them. And, and, and so um, one of the things that I'm very proud of is that that documentation is accepted by the courts as, as um, um, what is the word that I want? Um, the expert witness, because it's all backed by primary resources. And so Indian peoples have a voice now in court. They have the history written, and they can prevent some of those termination policies from happening to, to future groups. Although termination does still happen to many Indian groups today. Uh, they are always in danger of having their lands taken from them. And so the fight goes on. Is this
this, uh, is there another question for Angie? I'm going to ask a combined question of Mr. Bo and Mr. Cobell. Um, we have our own segregation right here in the Northwest with our Native Americans. And if you could create a curriculum, because I'm, my discovery and my travels throughout the world show me that segregation is not only created by uh, culture, it's created by geography and economics. And when there is no way to move people socially or economically, physically, from one place to the other without putting kids on buses and busing them for hours and hours to go to school someplace else, what kind of a curriculum could be created so that in the early years that we fight the bigotry in both the affluent schools and in the economically and socially deprived schools so that they're proud of their culture, that we can all be proud of each of who we are and yet share in the, the diversity of, of the other cultures without having to put people on buses and shipping them for three miles or three hours a day. If you could magically write those curriculum, both Bistavo. Well, that's a very difficult question. And I hope that I live long enough to see some real changes in that area. Reservations are so poor and the people are so segregated from the rest of the community that we as a nation need to make great strides in that area if we are going to see some positive changes take place. The best we can do that I can encourage you to do at this point is to read, do your research, look at good sources, learn all you can, and help educate your communities on these issues. Well, given the fact that uh, so much of our area here is, is rural yet, and uh, as you point out, there's great distances, and so uh, busing uh, long distances isn't probably an answer. We're going to have to rely uh, on a curriculum uh, of a lot of reading, uh, visual education today with uh, computers and television to try to uh, create a contact between uh, people. It, it, there's no easy answer there. It's going to have to be curriculum uh, to move the people back into the mainstream of society. But even today in our uh, larger urban societies, did you know that in, in New York City, uh, they school district there built uh, a brand new school a half a block from Lincoln Center uh, as to be a model of integration. And today, it's all black and Hispanic. The white students have been bussed out. And even the New York Times comments that this was supposed to be the great model, and, uh, and it hasn't happened. The same thing in, over in Seattle. Busing hasn't happened there, hasn't worked there. Uh, it may take a long time yet uh, for us to become educated. And, and I think uh, uh, the books that I have written aim to try to turn that around and change it. Uh, it'll remain to be seen what happens. My question is for Angie. I was wondering if there were actually any negative repercussions from the people that you exposed in your research towards you.
Well, there was certainly a lot of denial. <laughs> and um, no one uh, wanted to have that book published, of course. And um, so um, I had to find another publisher. Um, repercussions, um, I think, I truly believe that for a time I, my life was in danger. Um, but nothing came of it, thank goodness. And I just um, put it aside and began to do other research and other writing and continue to push to have that book published. And eventually I did. Thank you. Are there other questions for Ms. Earhart? All right, we'll come this way. Miss Debo, I'm just curious as to how you've catch up, kept such a sweet disposition with all this stuff going on. Now that's the kind of question I enjoy. <laughs> I have been blessed throughout my life to have the most wonderful friends. You know, um, after my parents died, I, I moved back to Marshall, Oklahoma, and a little house there. And, and I'm a bit infirm today, but I have wonderful neighbors that come and um, look out for me. And, um, I have uh, young students who are very interested in helping me document my research and organize my papers. And I just have a community that thinks I'm wonderful. And uh, it's a blessing. I have truly been blessed to be so cared for. Thank you. This is addressed to Mr. Kosal. Um, oftentimes, a problem when we look at it is we have to look at the uh, uh, devil is in the details. Uh, states' rights, federalism, uh, school board. I think your book was written mainly for urban, or from your experience in urban schools. How, do, how does this proposal for school vouchers play in the scheme of things? Or is it just a farce, uh, an excuse? Uh, how would that apply to urban schools? The question is, uh, how would uh, school vouchers uh, uh, apply to urban schools and uh, school vouchers don't apply? School vouchers, again, uh, I think uh, you said it, uh, they're an excuse to uh, uh, move people, uh, again, to segregated communities. Um, to move to use taxpayer money uh, to create an all-white school or a, a school where there's no minorities, uh, and uh, there's um, I, I think that there are a lot of uh, political leaders today who fight against uh, that because what you're doing is creating private education with a school voucher, and uh, that runs contrary to. Uh, uh, good education. Mr. Castle, you were talking about, um, don't you think that the situation in the urban situ uh, in the urban centers, in the urban schools, don't you think that is really just the underlying uh, current of what America is becoming? It is becoming a polarized society, and that those schools represent that, that when you have the white plight or flight out of the urban centers that they're, it's manifested through our media. I mean, do you, do you see that or, um, I haven't read your book, but I'm interested to do that. But that's what I, that's what I see and I'm curious as far as what your, your comments on that are. Well, there was certainly hope 
since uh, uh, when Brown versus uh, uh, the board uh, uh, occurred, and uh, later on, uh, even during the Warren Burger Court, and the order came to uh, integrate all public schooling immediately, uh, there was a great deal of hope, but then that didn't occur. It did in small degrees, but uh, cities, uh, city school boards, uh, state governments, uh, uh, political leaders, uh, concerned about the vote all the time and who's voting and who's supporting them, uh, the uh, methods for integration, busing and integrating the schools, uh, gradually fell by the wayside and politics became far more important. Uh, and that's what we're confronted with today. It's not something that uh, we really want to talk about. Uh, it's not something you're going to see or hear a lot about in the media at all. Uh, and uh, hopefully people will start to notice uh, a little bit or become far more concerned uh, about the condition of our children here in the United States of America. I believe that sometimes that this nation cares less for its children than any nation on earth. Well, I think we have time for one more question. I guess my question would be for the gentleman or the lady can answer it too. It seems to me if you were to write an ideal curriculum, it would start in elementary school by teaching children diversity. But how do you do that when many of their own parents may still fear other races, those that aren't white such as themselves? <laughs> Got lots of ideas about character. <laughs> well, Amy, the teacher. Would okay. <laughs> well, coming from one of the most diverse school districts in the nation, I'm out of character. If you got that, <laughs> but I, I can't resist addressing this slightly. Um, I came from one of the most diverse school districts in the nation, which is San Diego. I taught at high schools where. There were seven or eight different ethnicities there. I think there are so many factors, but it, school can make an enormous difference. Uh, with multi, multiculturalism, thinking of addressing the students, making them feel safe in a school, you need money to do it. You need to be funded in your schools. Yes, you need good curriculum, but I found that a good school administrator is absolutely essential. And somebody at the, in, in charge of a school who truly wants to make each child feel safe and welcome at that individual school can make miracles happen. And I've seen schools where that happened. And so the biggest difference between that and some schools in urban settings, unfortunately, very low funding. Some of the teachers who do not want to be there and are some of the lowest paid in the nation and keeping the more experienced teachers who still have energy and passion from their work at some of the more desirable schools in a district. So it, there's a lot of factors, there's not just one, but I have seen very good things happen in very diverse schools, um, and so I know it can work. Thanks for giving me the opportunity not to be Amelia for that. <laughs> the problems in the urban schools is the, uh, the vast turnover of teachers. Uh, even today in uh, the South Bronx or in, in our nation's capital, uh, one of the schools uh, right next to where they're building the big brand new multi-hundred million dollar baseball stadium, there the school is about 98% black and Hispanic. Uh, teacher, there's a big ter teacher turnover, and particularly in the elementary schools. 
uh, some elementary schools uh, and classes and children have as many as uh, uh, a dozen or 20 teachers within a, within a year uh, because uh, um, they're brand new teachers. They're just brought right in and put in that situation and they're not prepared for it. Uh, and so they leave. And because of the curriculum that's imposed, the regimented curriculum, uh, some of the teachers leave to go into corporate life or to go to law school or uh, we have to, we have to make teaching and we have to make uh, uh, the profession more attractive and uh, we have to reward our teachers far better. You know. Well, I too would like to go out of character for this question, and I'm glad you, you brought up the previous question about education. Um, everything that's been said is, uh, I'm all behind it. Uh, you have to start with the teachers. You have to educate the teachers about the different ethnic groups and their beliefs and their styles of learning, and there's so much that teachers need to learn. You have to encourage teachers to stay so that you don't have this huge turnover. Make it worth their while. Make it an important um, community within those schools. Um, when it comes to Indian education, I want, I'd like to go back to your question. Um, Angie Debo died before she saw a lot of changes in that area. But today, in Indian country, Indian peoples have more control over their curriculum. They have more monies because of the new Buffalo, which is casino. So they have new schools. They can hire good teachers. They can hire Indian peoples to be teachers. They can educate their own people. Uh, a good example of what's going on in the schools today, in rural schools and reservation areas, is what's happening in our own local area with the Coeur d'Alene Indians. They have a new school. They offer education to all, not just their people, but anyone who works in any um, of the um, Indian um, businesses, such as the casino. Uh, they very much promote education. They promote community. They give the schools in their community and outside their community monies to help with education. It's very important to them. They teach their children pride in their culture, and they teach their children um, that community is important and that all people are valuable. And I think these are lessons that we can learn from them. Uh, but certainly, it, it, it will start with the teachers and helping them learn how to teach. Well, um, our panel draws to an end. Would you like to give a thanks to our, our speakers, our characters, our presenters? <laughs> And thank you all for coming this afternoon. We have an entire week of activities. I hope you'll partake of them. Thank you. <laughs>